probable that the Celts discovered America before the Vikings got here. And the story of Brendan is probably a record, a memory of this uh, attempt. Um, Brendan went, it was this monk who sort of went in quest of the Isles of the Blessed, and you know, he was living in Ireland, and uh, he heard that they were west. So he got a sort of into this you know, absurdly little thing called a coracle, and just went sailing off with his monks. And you read this, and he goes to these different islands and has these different mythological adventures. One of the first adventures, though, that he has is they land on what they think is an island, and they set up the mass, and they're in the process of performing mass when this thing wakes up, and they all jump into their boats and take off. The interesting thing uh, turns out to be that um, it's a cyclical model because every year, in accordance with the ecclesiastical calendar, they have to land back on that fish every year until they learn how to perform the mass without disturbing the fish. Interesting <laughs> image with respect to Christian, the Christian mentality. And um, uh, so, but the interesting thing is, um, it's the same thing in, uh, you know, remember the Empire Strikes Back when they land in the cave and they wake it up, they don't realize that they're on this asteroid, that they're in the side of the giant belly of a beast, and they fly it. It's the same image because outer space is now to our imagination what the Earth was to the imagination of the ancients. The world in which we don't know what's out there, but we always assume that there are these mythological beasts, the great beast, the beast always personifies the dynamism inherent in nature and in the unknown. So we always populate, all these maps are populated with the areas that are terra incognita with these little dragons and monsters. And uh, the Vikings, by the way, when they, uh, you know, supposedly they discovered America in the year 1000, when they arrived um, in Greenland, they already found this little colony of Celts there ahead of them. So, and there are these interesting place names in Nova Scotia. If you ever look at a map, there are some interesting Celtic place names over there that uh, may suggest that the Celts were there long before anybody else other than the Native Americans. Here's um, Ptolemy's map, which uh, dates from 150 AD, uh, and, uh, but it was rediscovered in the 15th century during the Renaissance. Remember, the Renaissance was the period when uh, all these texts were being rediscovered. And uh, what was happening was that in Constantinople, where, which was the center, the sort of realm of the Greek world at that time, the Greek Byzantine Christianity, was being overrun by the Arabs. And finally, in 1453, it collapsed. The Arabs came pouring in. And all these refugee Greek monks came pouring over into uh, the, uh, Europe, Italy in particular, carrying with them all of these Greek classics that had been lost to the West uh, through the Middle Ages. And amongst those texts were the Corpus Hermeticum and uh, the works, the entire body of the writings of Plato and Plotinus, but also some of these lost texts of Ptolemy. Uh, the map itself, uh, Ptolemy's geography itself is actually goes back to 1406, but this map wasn't drawn up uh, until printed until 1482. Now, um, the main structural feature to draw your attention to here is here's the European world. The Greeks have got it basically right. That's the surprising thing here. Um, Eratos the, the Greeks knew the Earth was round. Um, I'm not sure how they figured it out, but Eratosthenes uh, got the circumference of the Earth right within 15%. He overestimated it, but he got it right. That's the amazing thing. And uh, as a result of that overestimation, uh, Columbus thought that uh, the, the latitude of, um, or rather the longitude of Asia is 180 on this map. It's actually 130. So he thought the distance between Asia and uh, um, Europe was actually much, much closer than it was. And that error in judgment becomes crucial in sending him off on his voyage. He kept getting resistance from people because they thought that it was much further than that. And it turned out to be indeed much further. And he probably wouldn't have gone if he had realized how far it was. But who knows. Um, over here, the, the Greeks' terra incognita is, was Africa. They really didn't know. They, they didn't venture out much beyond the Mediterranean. So they've got the African, this weird phenomenon of Africa connecting with Asia to form, to reduplicate a, Mediter a, Mediterranean, a Mediterranean within the uh, Indian Ocean. And um, the Arabs, however, knew that the two were not connected. There's an Arabic map, which was drawn up in 1456. And uh, they knew very well, over here they have a space between, uh, they were constantly sailing into the Indian Ocean doing business with the uh, Hindus. So they knew very well the two weren't connected. This map is upside down by our standards uh, because Mecca has to be, you have to face in the direction of Mecca. So their south is our north, our north rather. Uh, so if we invert it, we get a recognizable. Right, uh, so here's Europe over here and uh, Africa looks like a sort of crescent moon and then the break over here. Uh, and this map actually had some influence on the map makers in the 15th century. 
And the 15th century here is the period of these great voyages. Prince Henry the Navigator was the first, he was a Portuguese, and he was the first really to begin to start uh, setting men out. He himself never went anywhere. He sort of set up shop uh, in, on the coast of Spain there and kept pushing these merchants to go out further along the coast of North Africa. He always kept encouraging them to go further, go further, starting in about the 1450s. And then eventually Diaz makes it uh, around the Cape of Good Hope here in 1488 and uh, finds out that Africa is not at all connected with Asia. So uh, Africa sort of is drawn up then like a sort of gigantic boot. And, uh, but uh, that Diaz's voyage put the kibosh on uh, Columbus's voyage as far as the Portuguese were concerned. They had their way through now. And because the uh, Portuguese and the Spaniards were in competition with each other, he went to the uh, Spaniards and the Spaniards uh, gave him the deal as soon as they found out about Diaz. Uh, so he had been going back and forth between the Portuguese and the Spaniards. And in fact, he was making a deal with the Portuguese when Diaz came sailing into the harbor, uh, ending his deal with the Portuguese. So um, Columbus was actually a, uh, he was a um, Genoese map maker whose boat was sunk by the French Armada as uh, they were sailing, and the boat sank, and he wound up in Portugal, and he was set up shop with his bro brother Bartholomew as a map maker, w living within uh, Portugal. And um, so he sort of set up shop there, and then he starts reading all these texts. He starts reading Marco Polo, and then he starts studying Ptolemy, and he starts getting this idea in his mind that if you sail west far enough, if the Earth is round, then you should indeed come across uh, um, a route to Japan or the East Indies. Here, uh, so here, by the way, is... Uh, so then he goes off on his uh, voyage in uh, 1492, as you know, and discovers the Caribbean islands. Uh, he dies with the medieval cosmology in his mind. He never did find out that he had discovered a new world. Amerigo Vespucci, however, on his heels in 1502, uh, discovered South America. And so, in this map by Waldseemuller in 1507, uh, this is the map that named America, and it was done by this German mapmaker, Waldseemuller, in 1507. Waldseemuller did not know about Columbus's voyages, um, and so if he had known about Columbus, he might have named uh, our country Columbia, but he didn't. And by the way, the word Columbus is interesting. That means dove. You remember the dove that's sent out by Noah after the flood to find new land? It's interesting the way myth works itself out in historical processes. Um, so here you can barely make out South America. It's this truncated thing. They have, they've got the shape of it right, and there's a little bit of America up here, and uh, Caribbean islands and so forth. Um, but, and then he puts Amerigo Vespucci up here, and uh, Ptolemy over here with the old Ptolemaic map, uh, with the, cur the land corrected, and then uh, Vespucci up here. And that's how America was named after this uh, map maker. And then uh, here's Rosselli, 1508. Um, this basically gives you the configuration of what about, and here, uh, here they are blowing the wind. They're just the winds, I believe, but I'm not sure about that. Um, the interesting thing about this map is it's basically correct, but for some odd reason we have Antarctica down here. Antarctica wasn't even discovered until uh, toward the very end of the 18th century and uh, was not, uh, nobody knew what its shape was until it was worked out throughout the 19th century. But here it is with the shape almost correct with this little hook here. And uh, so that's an, an anomaly that is difficult for the scholars to explain. It was always thought that there was a southern continent, but here I find that the shape of Antarctica is suspiciously correct. Charles Hapgood was a man who wrote a book called uh, uh, Voyages of the Sea Kings, in which he postulated that there was this civilization on Antarctica who uh, may have been the primal civilization, and then uh, they, had, they were this, these maritime people who sailed all over the place and then um, sort of spread these maps. But that's a whole other story. So that brings us sort of through the first revolution with respect to these cosmological revolutions that ended up destroying the medieval worldview. And so we begin with this kind of earthly vision of the disintegrate, the sort of Columbus coming out and um, cutting open the Ouroboros that was binding the world and sort of opening that up and then sort of stepping out and discovering uh, sort of infinite space. And it's about that time, by the way, in the 15th century, that depth perspective is discovered in painting. And so while that's going on in painting, these voyages are going on out uh, amongst these men. And so what we're getting, as we'll see when we go over Gebser and look at the birth of perspective in painting, is this vast new discovery of infinite space.